All right, people, we are back. I jokingly said that we were gonna crash the internet and uh, I'm pretty sure we crashed YouTube literally out of every live stream we have ever done. We have never had an issue. I don't know what happened there. I have uh, conferred with these two fine men and we're not willing to completely go down the conspiracy theory yet. We're gonna have to just recap what happened in 10 minutes. I believe, well, first off, Ben Shapiro to my left, ironically, <laughs> Jordan uh, Peterson to my right. Uh, I believe that we are fully right now in an idea revolution. We talked about this for about 10 minutes. We'll try to recap a little bit of what we started with and then get to some all, all new stuff. Uh, as I've said to the guys, they're welcome to talk directly to each other. If they have questions for me, we can. Ed, there are no rules here. There are never rules in here, but truly today there are no rules. Uh, and I, I think that these guys are in the thick of something just tremendously important right now and relevant, and that's why uh, they're blowing up the way that they are. Okay. Let's try to do some of that again, although you guys were both quite eloquent uh, the 10 minutes ago. Um, idea revolution, do you believe that we are in an idea revolution right now? Well, this is what I think's happening. I think, and I think this accounts for the attractiveness of the content that I've put on YouTube. So when Nietzsche diagnosed the death of God about 150 years ago, and his, he made three predictions, he said, People will, as a consequence, our culture will shake to the roots, will become nihilistic or totalitarian in response, or will invent our own values. Okay, those, those were his three possibilities. And then, and then, of course, we became nihilistic and totalitarian, as, totalitarian through the 20th century, and many tens of millions of people died as a consequence, which Nietzsche also foretold specifically. He said that 100 million people would die because of the rise of communist ideas. He said that in Will to Power. So then he predicted that, well, we would have to invent our own values. But then the psychoanalysts came along. They said, well, wait a second. You can't, you can't create your own values because you're not master in your own house. There are forces operating inside of you that are autonomous. And for Freud, those were pr primarily biological forces. But Jung took that a step further and he said, well, wait a minute. Biology is a lot more sophisticated and complex than you think. And there are symbolic forces at work. He thought of the archetypes as images of the instincts for example, but the instincts were a lot more sophisticated than people thought. So it's not just an instinct to aggression, let's say. There's an instinct to operating properly so that you walk up hierarchies, human hierarchies of competence. It'd be something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's an archetype of the ideal in some sense. Jung thought the gods didn't disappear, they went inside, they went into the psyche. And so he dove down as far as he could dive to find out what those eternal images were and to bring them back up to the surface. And that's what I've been continuing, I would say, in my lectures. I'm saying, look, there's, there are elements to the ancient story that are not only, they're deeply correct and you cannot live, <laughs> and you live in hell unless you know them. It's something like that, and that's the case. So. And I think that's, I'm hoping that's what is happening, is that people are starting to understand that people, people's lives do have a transcendent purpose. That's the most appropriate way of looking at life. That our brains are in fact evolved to reveal that purpose to us, which I also believe. I think the neuro, neurological evidence in that regard is quite clear. I believe that. And so I hope, I'm hoping that what, what we're, we're at the end of postmodern despair. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, so to me, what you're giving there is sort of a realist version of religion. You're, you're saying these stories are needed for a very real way. I suspect you basically agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I do. And it, well, what's, what's fascinating about this is, uh, I mean, Jordan may be closer to Aristotle than I am to Plato, but I think that we almost have a Platonic versus Aristotelian argument going on here because it seems like what, what, what you're talking about is the idea that if we dig down deep enough into our biologies and into our neural networks, what we find is a common set of shared values that if you refuse to acknowledge them leads to grave unhappiness. And what I'm, I'm almost- At every coming, level. Right, and what I'm coming from is almost a platonic idea, which is that the mind of man reflects the mind of God yeah. to the extent that you can, that not only is, is I, I would argue is an orthodox Jew, revelation is necessary, but even if you don't use revelation, that using your capacity to reason, you can find a purpose in something above. But we end up at the yeah. same place, which is the set of well, values that if you actually, uh, if, you, if you stray away from this common set of values, and I'm talking like the most root level values, personal responsibility, free will, it's your job to be responsible for members of your family. Uh, it's yeah. your job to make good decisions and responsible decisions and not to blame the society around you for failures that you are yourself responsible for. You can't surpass your own uh, innate capacity in, in 
in terms of, you can't expect society to make up for your lack of innate capacity in certain areas. You just mm -hmm. have to make the most of what you have in front of you. You and I agree on the values, but I think that the source of the values, there's going to be a slight disagreement. Well, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound place for disagreement. Because, and I don't understand how to mediate it exactly. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not willing to dispense with the metaphysical. You know, when I did my biblical lectures last year, I, I called them a, psych, a psychological approach to right. biblical stories, right? Because I wanted to push a secular interpretation, a scientific interpretation. Which, by the way, stories. I think is, is just not to interrupt, but I think that that's supremely useful to people, specifically because, I mean, despite the fact that I come from a religious background, I'm trying to make arguments that are not religious in orientation. I never cite to the Bible when I talk about values, for example. I never cite to right. Revelation. It's valuable to me because I think that that's a, a good source of the values, and I think that it's a, a relevant source of the values. But it is not the only way to achieve those values. I've never suggested, for example, that atheists can't be moral or that you can't mm -hmm. be an agnostic and not believe in Judeo-Christian systems of revelation and come to the same exact set of values that we're talking about now. Well, and it's also a simpler argument to make because you constrain the number of necessary variables, right? right? Exactly. So, but, <laughs> but, I'm, but having said that, I'm not willing to dispense with the metaphysical. And I think, like, I think it's, and I'm like stretching the edges of my cognitive ability when I'm talking about this sort of thing, because I'm in realms that I don't understand, it's, it's that I'm just getting vague pictures <coughs> of. But I think it's as if there's, a, there's a, revela a revelation from evolution that matches the revelation from above. The mm -hmm. two things come together, and, and I, don't I don't understand how that can be possible. I think it has something to do with the fundamental nature of consciousness, which is something we seriously do not understand. And so, I can see you can make a straight biological case for the evolution of archetypes, but I don't think that the biological explanation exhausts the archetype. Mm -hmm. There's more to it. And, and what I've learned too in delving into these religious stories, but also into religious experience, is that it's bottomless. Like there is a point where as you dig into the archetypal, everything turns into one thing. Biological, mm -hmm. spiritual, transcendent, it's all one thing from the top to the bottom. And I think people get intimations of that when they have profound experiences, experiences that are generated by music, for example, mm -hmm. or by love, mm -hmm. or by sex, or there's a variety of ways that they can be, anytime you have an experience of meaning in your life. And I can also see that, and I believe this to be the case, is that you are, you're neurologically adapted to a universe where meaning is the highest instinct. And I mean that technically, yep. is yep. that when you're sitting in a situation where what's happening around you is meaningful, what your nervous system is signaling to you is that you occupy the optimal position in the dynamic territory that you currently inhabit. And, that's, and that sense of meaning is, it's not just cortical, it's, it's way deeper than merely cortical. And so that's a very exciting, that's a very exciting discovery, I would say. Well, and I think that because, the, the, again, a place where we agree is that meaning is uncovered. It's not some, it's discovered. It's not something that, that you're making up yourself. And that's why I think- It's revealed. It, exactly. And because yeah. we're going Like happiness. To, exactly. And I think that one of the reasons that, that the message that we're putting out there is, is making people happier, actually, mm -hmm. uh, even though we're both pessimists by nature, I would mm -hmm. think, uh, mm -hmm. is that what we're basically saying is that in this land of chaos where you could yeah. be wandering around with no meaning, yeah. there is a meaning. And if you search for it, you'll find it. But you have yeah. to be open to the concept that there is a meaning yes. to be discovered. Yes. And if you shut yourself out from that by just saying, there's no meaning to be discovered. Meaning is to be made up by you and you can just yeah. do what you want. Or it's and, epiphenomenal. Right, exactly. You know, something it, like it's, that. Just, it's just something that you experience, but it's not really real. Yeah. You know, th that, that kind of stuff is, is uh, I think, disquieting to people. And so there's something that quiets the soul yes. uh, that, that says you have purpose. And, and if you don't have purpose, then maybe it's because you're searching in the wrong places yes. for that purpose. Yes, that's you know, a possibility. That's th right. There's that's a right. few interesting things that you said there because it's like, I, I know you guys pretty well at this point and, the, and this crew of people that we're sort of in. When, when we're off camera, we're actually talking about the exact same things. <laughs> like we are, li whether this camera was on right now or off, like we're living this thing all the time. I think it's, I can speak from my own experience in this regard, it's made me a better person and I will, and I'm still striving How? to be a better. How? I'm more authentic, I'm more honest, I'm constantly, I mean I sit in, in this chair when it's over there and look at the person over here every week and I actually hear and I listen. Right. And I sit across great minds and I go, wow, I have to reevaluate some of the things that mm -hmm. I think. And I, sometimes it's because I disagree with someone. Uh, you know, and I'm like, they really don't know what they're talking well, about. But often it's hopefully that I'm hearing somebody and, say mm -hmm. some great things. Right, but right. th this is what's really interesting. And I think what's, what's great about conversations like this one is when 
if I have Jordan on my Facebook Live and I ask him questions or he'll have me on his YouTube and he's asking questions, what we're all really in the business of, all of us who are occupying the space, is asking questions. Mm -hmm. And we're treated as weird because we're asking the questions, right? If and you ask, actually listening to the answers. Yeah. Right, exactly. Because I always think, well, you know, you might have something to tell me. That's my rule number 11, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> right, assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. Right. And, and because then you can, they can tell that to you, and if you learn it, then you don't have to run face first into a brick wall. Exactly. So like, it's really helpful. And, I mean, and from Jewish tradition, that's deeply embedded in Jewish tradition, that the wise man is the man who learns from every man around him. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, this idea is, is, is what unifies this really disparate stream of people, right? Yeah. The three of us, people like Sam Harris, people like Joe Rogan. Right. I mean, like, you look at me and Joe Rogan, I'm not right. sure what we have in common. Right, exactly. Right, right, right. But we like asking questions. Right. And we you like actually look like you might answers. be different species. Yeah. Of, right. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Right. right, right. Well, that's, I found the same thing when I was on Jocko Willink's podcast. It's like, you know, we're, we're very different people, but that's what's in common, is that we're able to have a conversation. We're actually able to have a conversation. And, and that we're aiming, I think, we're, we're all aiming at making things better rather than worse which is also a very important thing I, to manage. I also think one of the things that, that makes that happen is the fact that we are, as you say, talking about first principles all the time. When people talk at the top of the iceberg, then it's impossible to, for them to even see sometimes that they're actually standing on two different icebergs. Mm -hmm. right? they're, they're, they're not seeing the commonalities, of, of, mm -hmm. and they're not seeing what, what's different. Like if, if I argue first principles with somebody, then you can see how those first principles manifest in political differences in the business mm -hmm. that I'm in. Um, but if you're just arguing about a certain political policy without examining anything that goes underneath there, then you just end up clubbing each other and not even understanding what the other person's saying because you don't understand the set of values they're deriving those political well, principles and from. Part of the problem that we have right now in our culture is trying to diagnose the level at which the discussion should be taking place. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think the reason that this is a tumultuous time is because it actually is a time for discussion of first principles. And it's, it's that, and yes. first principles are virtually at the level of theology, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. first principles are the things that you assume and then move forward. It's like, well, what should we assume? Well, the dignity of the human soul. Mm. Let's start with that. You can't treat yourself properly without assuming that. You can't have a relationship with another person. You can't stabilize your family. You can't have a functional society. So what does it mean for this human soul to have dignity? Well, the part of the idea is that you're participating in creation itself, and you do that with your actions and your language. And you get to decide whether you're tilting the world a bit more towards heaven or a bit more towards hell. And that's actually what you're doing. So that's a place where the literal and the metaphorical truth come together. And people are very... They're terrified of that idea, as they should be, because mm -hmm. it's a massive responsibility. <laughs> it's a massive realization of responsibility to understand that all the decisions that you make during the day are decisions between hell and heaven, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But I think there is no truer way of saying that. So as you guys have both sort of hit the level that you're at, and I was at the turning point thing with you mm -hmm, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, and, and you literally came out, it was like the Rolling Stones came out. I mean, people, <laughs> people were going bananas. I talked about all my political differences with them that we've discussed, mm -hmm. about being pro-choice and for gay marriage, although they're basically okay with that, mm -hmm. and, and being pro-pot and all that, and I got a standing ovation. We did our thing in, in Clemson, and the line for you after was longer than the line for me. And I told you this, but I was like, man, that makes me want to be better. I have to up my, I wasn't jealous of you. I was like, man, he's doing something great and I have to be better. So my question for you is, this was all meant to be, right? I mean, without going too religious <laughs> or metaphysical, but the internet sort of has now allowed all of the people that were watching television and seeing pop culture and going, something is really wrong here. Something is missing. The internet has sort of forced us together. I mean, that's, this, I this growing group is because we're, it's not because we're all looking for it, it's because we're being forced together. And what's, what's really funny is the way that everybody's introduced to our work is, is the same way, but it's the way that you wouldn't expect. So most people, I think, Jordan, originally saw you in a confrontation with somebody over transgender pronouns, mm -hmm. right? And that's how most people began to engage. And then suddenly you were getting 500,000 views on discussions of biblical stories from Genesis, mm -hmm. which, yeah, I mean, let's be frank, if, if, if the first thing never happens, those things have 5,000 views, right? Right, right? And the same thing is true for me, right? The way that, that I originally kind of drew public attention was because I was on Piers Morgan's show and I shall act him on a show. And so all of a sudden people were now listening to hour long lectures about, about you know, my, my ideas on philosophy and root principles of the founding yeah. fathers. They came and, for the scandal and stayed for the content. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, I think, the advantage. That it, it takes a particular skill set for everyone in this space to be able to do that. But that's, that's the beauty of the, of the YouTube moment and of the internet moment, is that people 
are engaging in the news level. If you just watch any new cable news channel, the news cycle is about 30 seconds long, then they yeah. repeat the headlines again. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the level at which we consume. But if you see, everybody sees the flashpoint for you, or the flashpoint for me, or the flashpoint mm -hmm. for Sam with Ben Affleck, yeah. or the flashpoint for you, and there are many of them for you. And then they, and then they want more. And it's the introduction of, the, it's basically the gateway drug. Like there's a 30 second video that's the gateway drug to these hour long lectures about deeper principles. And people, and the reason that the, and the, the question is why those flashpoints flash. And I think the, the, because what makes those different? What makes it that people want to see that? And then they go, okay, now I want to see the rest of their content and start streaming tons of videos from these folks. Well, that yeah. Kathy Newman video so, uh, is a good example Exactly, of that. exactly. Yeah, so, so let, let, let's get to that in one second. Okay, I, want, I just want to lead that with quick one answer, thing. Yeah. Quick, is, is just that I think it's incongruity. They see something yes. different, and if you notice difference in the society on any level, then you are automatically a pariah and an outlier, and we all know deep down that there are distinctions and differences to be made logically between, I'm not even talking about groups of people ethnically, you know, for, for some odd reason. I'm talking about just logical distinctions between modes of thought and logical distinctions between, uh, between certain policies. And if you, if you are willing to draw distinctions instead of just saying that we have to exist in this morass of identity politics, mm -hmm. That's a, it's a flash in the darkness, and people gravitate toward the light like moths. Well, I, it's partly because the problem with, the problem with rel relativism, let's say, let's say mm -hmm. that that did produce a radical state of equality. Well, the problem with that is that there's no up. <laughs> and the problem with there being no up is there's no hope. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that people actually live on hope. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you flatten out the value structure so that there's no qualitative differentiation between things, then there's nothing to do. So that's just not helpful. And so then you can tell people, look, make no mistake about it. There is down. That's hell. That's Auschwitz. That's the gulags. Like that's down. That exists. That exists in your own family. You can create that with no problem. And because there's a down like that, there's also an up. And that up is worth aiming at, even though it differentiates people as they climb towards it. It's still, without that, you, you can't have the purpose in your life that gives it meaning and nobility in the face of suffering. Well, that's People know that. That's interesting because that's why I sort of think it's almost like we're all Frankenstein's monster in a weird way. If the, if the mainstream media had been dealing honestly with the issues of the day, whatever they are, identity mm -hmm. politics or postmodernism, or just the general political discussion, then I don't think people would react to you guys the way that well, they do because they, they didn't do their job. But really quickly, because you, yep. you hit these. So your mo I think there are three moments, and, and mm -hmm. you already hit them, mm -hmm. but just for people that, that aren't following, Following all this, you on Piers Morgan, basically bashing him endlessly with facts o over feelings <laughs> ab about guns was one, where it was like this guy from the internet just beat this CNN per person. How did that happen? And then I think you know, the one that changed me more than anything else, everyone knows this already, was Sam Harris on Real Time yep. with, with Affleck and they got into this stuff about, about the difference between Muslims and Islam. I didn't even know who Sam was. I see this mild-mannered neuroscientist in a nice suit calmly talking about Pew statistics. Next thing you know, he's gross and racist. But, but this is a good segue to yours because I think yours is the third one. And the way that, it, this is just two or three weeks ago, uh, you were on with Kathy Newman on, it's Canada Channel 4. No, it was UK Channel 4. Uh, UK, UK Channel 4, Channel sorry. 4, yeah. And there, there's, I mean, everyone that's watching this has probably seen this already. Uh, if you haven't, you should go watch it. Yeah, and if you haven't, <laughs> you should go watch it. But, but in effect, basically she tried to make an argument that you have heard a gajillion times before, but why does your right to free speech supersede a trans person's right to feel okay with themselves or something? Even the way she phrased the question was a little confused mm -hmm. and, and conflated. But, well, I, the but, thing, but the, the reaction thing, to it, 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 yep. it your, your answer was great, but it was the reaction, the regular people watching at home that were going, this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is just abject nonsense. Well, the, well, the, thing, the thing that made it viral is the fact that she recognized in the moment that what she was saying was nonsense. <laughs> right, you could see. It was the moment yeah. where, where you could see the light go on briefly and she just went, wait, what did I just say? Yeah. And there was no escape. It was, yeah. it was, pretty, it was pretty grand. Yeah. yeah, well, the funny thing about her argument is that it's pre it was predicated on the idea that somehow people have a right to be comfortable. It's like, that's just not a right you have in life. <laughs> of all the things you can say that you don't have a right to in life, being comfortable is number one. Yeah, which you made is, that point to yeah. him. You can offend me right now, well, right? So the thing is, is if you... If your right to be comfortable trumps my right to talk, then I don't get to talk, ever. Because I'm going to say things, if I'm actually talking, I'm going to say things if they're, if they're profound things, if they're contentious things or truthful things, I'm going to say things that if they don't disturb you are gonna disturb <laughs> you, and if they don't disturb you, there's someone that's gonna be disturbed about them. So what's the answer to that? Everyone can be comfortable in the silence. 
But that doesn't, also doesn't work because then we can't exchange ideas. We're not comfortable in the silence. We're isolated and dead in the silence. So it's a completely incoherent perspective. But what does that tell you about just the way mainstream media operates? Because if you even, even just in this last week, when I've read some of the pieces about you that I think are so dishonestly attacking the way you do things, or even, you know, I'll see, some, there was an article about you and it was like, Ben Shapiro is the cool kids philosopher or something, yeah, something like that. Times, yeah. I, yeah, and it was like, well, Wait a minute. When did the cool kid be the smart Orthodox Jew? You know what I mean? Like, how did how did it's, that? It's a new one to me. But but, but but right. But but right. Like, think about that. And then you've talked you've right. talked about the shit that you went through when you were growing up and all that stuff. And, and you don't want to oh, yeah, play I got the my victim ass regularly. Yeah, but I mean, but I, I can't imagine. Yeah, why. yeah. <laughs> I was in exactly the same boat. It's like small. And noisy. Exactly. It's a bad combination. Exactly right. Oh man, I could have taken care of both of you. I always say I was right on the middle of, of sort of like loser and cool. So like I actually did bully the kids below me, but I was bullied by the guys that were I was right there. Maybe <laughs> that's that, how maybe God that, keeps the world in balance. There you go. <laughs> but but this idea that when they write the article, it's the cool kids philosopher, even though obviously you didn't grow up as the cool kid, or James Damore is a great one where they write articles about him and they'll say the, the tech bro. And it's like if you, you both have met James Damore, he's the shyest, quietest, Decent, you, literally, not, you almost literally have to drag sentences out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did an hour yeah. and a half with him. Yeah, <laughs> but but he's got a spine of steel, though. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. it's really something. Yeah, fearless, yeah. Desp despite what his disposition yeah. may actually be. But yeah. but what do you make of that? The way that they try to frame it, so they're already trying to undercut well, you. You know again, what I mean? Before it, before you even not say to use it, not to use your model, but I think that they're trying to impose their own order on the chaos. It's just the wrong frame. Mm -hmm. So they, well, it, that's it, that's what happened in the Channel Four interview, yeah. and it's it's sort of I was thinking about the model that you were describing with regards to your position on the iceberg, is that Kathy had staked out a position on the iceberg, and I had staked one out that was way lower, like mm -hmm. way lower, and. What happened was she kept questioning me at her level of right. analysis, and that just wasn't working because that wasn't the level of analysis at which I'm playing, and I'm, and well, and I'm also not playing, although I'm trying to play. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, because right. it's better well, it's if you can it's, yeah, play exactly. a little bit. But yeah, I it's, mean, it's I, like wrestling. You had a lower base of gravity, mm -hmm. and and I think that that gave you an advantage. And that's, well, and, partly I wasn't trying to win the interview. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like I and I don't try to win interviews. I try to go to an interview and have a talk, and have a discussion, and see well, how it goes. And I don't have an agenda except to not make a catastrophic mistake. But, but that's, that's agenda number yeah, one. Well, yeah. Don't say anything unforgivably stupid. Yeah. But I, th I, think that's, I think that's the other thing that, that makes all of this unique, is that if you actually meet, and you, I mean, we've all met each other in this circle now, because it's really funny how life works that way, that these circles are so small, that we yeah. know each other, and we actually talk with each other, and all this. That's what um, I'm saying. They're forcing but, us together. It's not even that we're seeking each other. But it's, right. it's also that we all have a certain, there's a certain baseline personality that we all have, and that is we enjoy the discussion. We actually enjoy the exchange of ideas. And so when you're on with Kathy Newman and she says stuff that, like, what, what, what you were getting from the right wing a lot was, how did he even stand this? How did he even stand this interview, right? How mm -hmm. can he get through half an hour of this? And you've done it, and I've, I've done it too. And the answer is because I sort of enjoy it. I mean, this is what we do for a living, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea that, that I don't enjoy having conversations, even with people who don't get it, it's not enjoyable having your views radically mischaracterized as, mm -hmm. as Kathy Newman was trying to do to you. That's irritating. Yeah. But it's, well, that it, was so over the top that it was hardly even irritating. It's mostly you know, <laughs> well, I, well, it was because right. I kept thinking, well, I don't know who you're talking to, but it isn't me. <laughs> right, exactly, you know? exactly. So, and so because of, because of that, that's the most infuriating thing to people on, on the hardcore left and in the media because if they can't fit you into that frame, it's what you were saying before the show started, if they can't fit you into this preconceived kind of Russian nesting doll that, they, yeah. that they've got for you if, if you, if you don't fit in there, then they can't do anything with you. And if you're an open-minded person who actually likes to hear exchange of ideas and you're willing to admit that there's a piece of evidence you may not have considered yet, it's almost impossible to be caught off guard. Mm -hmm. right? and they, but these people refuse to acknowledge that there's evidence they haven't considered yet, or they just throw away the evidence. Like, yeah, if I brought well, you a piece of evidence that contradicted your worldview, you'd say, okay, that either fits in my worldview or it doesn't. If it doesn't, but it's a real piece of evidence, here's how I have to kind of shape and change my worldview in order to accommodate mm -hmm. that piece of evidence. And, and I think that's what smart and decent people do, but well, the media is not in that Joe, business. I think that's why Joe's show is successful, Agreed. is because... You know, he's not a classical intellectual. He talks about ideas a lot. But the thing about Joe is he's actually curious. He, when he asks a question, he'd like to know the answer, <laughs> you know? And it's not so that he can demonstrate that he's right. Like, he has his viewpoints, obviously, like everyone does, because you have to have a viewpoint. But he does ask the questions he'd like to know the answers to. And that's, that, and YouTube seems to reward that. 
-hmm. So hooray for that. Well, it's also yeah. the fact that it's a longer forum, a longer yeah. span forum is also a non-trivial advantage, you know, yeah. because I, people can take the time to really dig into something. I, I've been thinking a lot about what makes all of these various people of such different stripes successful. And what I realized is that so much of it is just like in any movie. It, the reason you watch a movie is because you know where the movie's going to end. It's going to end with the movie go, turning off the screen and then you're going to leave the theater, right? Every movie ends the same way. But it's, you're there for the journey. And so when you watch your show, Dave, and you're actually trying to pursue things and take people along your thought journey and when you watch your lectures on the Bible and you're tracking them along a journey, mm -hmm. a journey of yeah, exploration definitely. and certainly with Joe's show where Joe is taking you for three hours through his thought process asking questions and going somewhere and even when I'm doing my political show my idea is here I'm going to lay out all the evidence and then I'm going to try and piece it together so that we get to a conclusion together and you can disagree with any step I take along that way but here's the journey yeah. that we're going to go along so you can follow along with me. I think what the media do is they just go straight from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie with no journey yeah, in between. That's right. They just go, okay, yeah. here's the intro, right? Luke Skywalker is is on a planet by himself, and then you just go straight to the Millennium Falcon flying away. Yeah. You're like, wait, 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 just what happened in the middle there? Well, yeah. how did you get from A so to B? So is that why we're we we then, or let's say your your moment with Kathy, that we're sort of the glitch in the system now? Hmm. Like to me, that was we're the undecidables in in postmodern terms. There, there yeah. you go. Right, mm -hmm. that's it. That that that's a glitch. Like if we were watching the Matrix, that's the glitch. Mm -hmm. That you got to the to the wasn't on YouTube. It, this was on re, you know real television. Not that that even matters more than this because I think this is the real thing now. But you caused a glitch. That's what you did. You caused a glitch in her. She actually couldn't come up with words after. <laughs> but you actually it was actually a glitch in the system that then yeah, well, there elevated was a, everything else that you're there doing. There was an imposed narrative, and I mean part of that's a consequence of the pathology of the medium. I would say is that one of the things that's really like I stopped watching televised news like 25 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, but one of the things that made me stop was my realization that the newscasters would show a politician, right, and then they'd give him like his 10 seconds or her, her 10 seconds to say something, then they'd fade out the audio, then the newscaster would tell you what the person said and what it meant, and I thought, oh, that's not so good, that's, that's, there's something gone, gone horribly wrong there, and I think that's, it's become more and more like that over the last 30 years. Partly, I think that's because journalism itself, classic journalism, is degenerating. You know, it's, it's becoming a more and more desperate game for, for smaller and smaller stakes. But YouTube offers something that, that, that the traditional broadcasters just can't offer. And that's, weirdly enough, for something that started out with cute cat videos, it's actual depth yeah. and the mm -hmm. capacity to mm -hmm. have like a three-hour conversation. Turns out people actually like that. But that's why so, I think that you two are particularly interesting cases because I view you as sort of like a pure political beast. And yet you've, because of all of this, you now talk about religion, I think, more than probably you inherently want to, perhaps, <laughs> or, or all of these other things. And you, as a clinical psychologist, this is the, the, that's where you really started. And now you end up talking about politics all the time. So again, this is why we all sort of got forced into this into well, because space. I, I think that in the end, we end up in the same frameworks that the ancient Greeks ended up in, right? They would all write a book on ethics, and they'd write one on politics, and then they would write one on, on the polity, and it, it all comes together. I mean, if, it, there is no such thing as apolitical, but by the same token, there's no such thing as aethical, right? I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you are operating in the sphere of politics, you are going to end up, if you dig deep enough, in the same waters that Jordan is used to being, and if Jordan elevates you know, up on that chain far enough, he's going to end up in the sphere where I'm used to operating, mm -hmm. which is why there are videos of you talking to transgender people mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. about pronoun use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's yeah, well, what happened to me, I think, was that like I was operating at a, let's call it a psychological level or an, an, a level of, of, of archetypal story, essentially. And then the political intervened in that and said, I'm going to interfere with your freedom of speech. It's like, no, <laughs> that's not happening. I know where that goes. Well, and then, of course, one of the scandals that emerged out of that this year was the scandal of Lindsay Shepard at Wilfrid Laurier University, which was the biggest scandal that ever hit a Canadian university. And it was like, had I, in my most pessimistic prognostications about the consequences of Bill C-16, I didn't envision the inquisition of Lindsay Shepard. Uh -huh. And so thank you very much, postmodernists, for making that manifest so clearly. So I'll be, I'll be the ignoramus see. in the room, so if you, can you tell that story? Oh, yeah. oh, well, there was a teaching assistant. Lindsay. She had a great episode on the Rubin Report, you should check okay. out. Yeah, yeah, well, she's quite the creature. She's a, they picked with, they messed with the wrong girl when yeah. they went after her, but she was in the communications department at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, and she had the temerity to show a five-minute clip of me just debating 
the biological reality of gender, let's say, with uh, Professor Nicholas Matt, who famously claimed that there were no biological differences between men and women, and that was the scientific consensus for the last four decades. She showed a five-minute clip to her class. Well, and hypothetically someone complained, although it turned out that no one really did, <laughs> yeah. and that was brought to the attention of her professors and to an administrator named Adria Joel, who was basically hired as a, you know, uh, as an inquisitionist, yeah, I would say, by the university, under legislative pressure, and they raked her over the coals for an hour, and she taped it. <laughs> and she made it public. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it was a tape in which they compared, they said that playing a, a video of me debating pronouns was neutrally, because she said she did it neutrally, and there's no reason to disbelieve her, was tantamount to playing a video by Hitler neutrally. Or Milo Yiannopoulos. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah, right, right, My comment right. on that has been that the radical leftists are so clueless that they can't even get their insults right. So it's do like, we, I'm not Milo Yiannopoulos or Hitler. It's like, <laughs> exactly. no, sorry, it's one or the other. You and I have been in this boat. Yeah, if you, yeah. I think this, this boat has some people in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, this Hitler boat. I mean, even right now, we know that you know someone's going to write about this and write that this was the gathering of the alt-right and mm -hmm. all that other yeah. nonsense. But in a weird way, do we owe the postmodernists some thanks then? Because if you think about it, they took, they forced someone like Lindsay to be public now. And I, and I think she's wonderful mm -hmm. and has you know, just a, a tremendous like intellect Weinstein and all that. Getting Brett Weinstein, I mean, my right? Like mm -hmm. all these, all of these people, you guys, me. I mean, everyone out of the, James Damore. I mean, mm -hmm. he only is someone now with influence because they forced him to address these mm -hmm. issues. So, in an odd way, we owe them. I mean, for for all the complaining that we oh, might yeah. do about these people, we owe them because they've sharpened. Not only they've not only sharpened us intellectually, but I think they've allowed well, all these other people to wake up. Well, the postmodernists had a point. Like the point is, is that the world is susceptible to a near infinite number of interpretations. That happens to be true. That's why developing artificial intelligence, especially perceptual systems, has turned out to be so difficult. It's very, very difficult to perceive the world because you can categorize it in literally in a near infinite number of ways. Okay, and, and then the next claim was, well, it's very difficult to rank order those ways in terms of quality. It's like, yeah, that is very difficult. But then they pushed it too far. Therefore, there are no qualitative distinctions between uh -huh. modes of interpretation. It's interpretation all the way down. It's like, no, no, good, good point, hard to disagree with, but fundamentally wrong. There's a finite set of viable interpretations. And so that's the, where they the, layman's, the layman's term for that would be that some things are real, right? I mean, is that the simplest way to say it? There are some things that actually are real. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's one objection. Another objection is there are some modes of being that lead you to perdition yeah. very, very rapidly. And, that's, and that isn't somewhere, being human, that you actually want to go. So there's the material reality that's outside the interpretive framework, you know, but then there's an ethical reality that's, that isn't material in the same simple sense, mm -hmm. but there's an ethical reality that's also not merely a matter of interpretation. I mean, the, the best example of that I know is Jack Panksepp's, Jack Panksepp's work with rats. I mean, there's lots of models of this in the animal kingdom, but that, this one's particularly good. So juvenile rats like to wrestle. So if you pair two rats together, two males, because they particularly like to wrestle, and one of them's 10% bigger than the other, the one with the 10% weight advantage can pin the little one, con consistently. Okay, so you say you pair them once, they'll work to do this because they enjoy it. The big one pins, he wins. Now he's the dominant rat. You think, mm -hmm. well, there's dominance among rats. Yeah, except that isn't how it works because rats in the wild live in social groups and they'll play with each other continually across many games. So then let's say you pair the two rats together constantly. Okay, after the first bout, the little rat, the loser, has to invite the big rat to play. That's the rule, so he does his little play maneuvers. Yeah. And the big rat thinks, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll play. If you pair them repeatedly, unless the big rat lets the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat will stop playing with them. I read that, it just blew me away. I thought, wow, look at that. In rats, which have been used as a model for human behavior for psychologists for like a hundred years. In rats, there's an emergent ethic of fair play that emerges across iterated games. It's like, really? Yeah. It's mind-boggling. So we could use that, that would be an example of like when I'm playing basketball with my eight-year-old nephew, I occasionally let him win. Yeah. Right? Because I want to, because he needs that reward to yeah. keep going if I just beat him mercilessly. Yeah, and if you're good, you let him win when he does something particularly spectacular, yeah. right? You push him, there's this thing called the uh, zone of proximal development, and it turns out that adults 
speak to children naturally at a level that's slightly above their level of comprehension. So that's the meaning zone, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so you keep the kid there because the kid can talk but also learn at the same time. And if you're really playing well with your eight-year-old nephew, you're going to let him win when he's pushing himself a little harder than mm -hmm. he normally would. And you think, well, that's, he is winning when he's doing that. And so you want to set up the game to reward him. Yeah. And that's an ethic that transcends mere interpretation. It's not, it doesn't only apply to human beings. It applies, and Franz de Waal, who studied chimpanzees, he's found quite clearly that it isn't the most tyrannical chimp who stays on top. Because the chimp tyrant who has no friends, who does no mutual grooming, who's not reciprocal, it's like he has an off day. And two of his enemies tear him to pieces. So the tyrant chimp sits atop a very unstable hierarchy. And so I've thought too, in, in the West, we don't have dominance hierarchies. We have competence hierarchies. And those are completely different. And you have to be a good player of iterated games to maintain your position in a competence hierarchy. And that's the beginnings of a, of a discussion about something like a fundamental ethic. So, so that's interesting. I think I can segue this to a little bit of the way that some of the media deals with you is that you, because you are fact-based, you talk fast, you, you don't care, I mean, you genuinely don't care about people's feelings. I, I, I know you pretty well now, you don't. That they Outside don't, of my they, immediate family. Right, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe your wife. But that, that they don't know how to respond to that then because they're used to dealing in a realm that is all about that. So now you come out and you're mm -hmm. like, no, 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 this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. I'll debate you, but you're not gonna beat me just because you happen to be gay or a woman mm -hmm. or whatever else it is. And I think actually now that's a lot of the reason of your, your surge. So well, I, I think that most people at root level don't actually want to think of themselves as their group identity first. I think most mm -hmm. people want to be respected on an individual level. And so when I say, in order for you to be respected on an individual level, that means that I'm not going to respect you on the group level. Right. Meaning I'm not, that your, your group identity doesn't mean anything to me. Your, your individual identity means everything to me, but your group identity means nothing to me. Mm -hmm. And when I say individual identity, I don't mean how you identify, you know, in terms of race or gender. I mean, in terms of your thoughts. Are your thoughts interesting or are they right or are they wrong? And they're either right or they're wrong and they're interesting or they're not. And that doesn't change based on who's saying it. And if we could all get there, I think that, that's what people find appealing, is that yeah. if you can get there, then you can actually have a discussion about ideas. If not, then you're just going to retreat into your identity, and there's no way for me to have a discussion with you. I mean, I just had a, a, a talk at UConn, uh, and one of the students got up and was talking about abortion, and she said, you know, I, I, I would never have an abortion, but you, as a white, privileged male, how could you talk about abortion? And I said, because right is right and wrong is wrong, regardless of whether I am a white, privileged male. I mean, that's the basis for Western civilization. Uh, no, otherwise, and, we yeah. can't have a... We can't have communicate a across we groups. We can't do anything. Exactly. That's right. And then what, what happens if we can't have a conversation across groups? Then we just fight for dominance. That's, that's exactly... Well, that, yeah. and that's the postmodern worldview, is yeah. that that's all we're doing. It's like, fine, but like... You're, you're, you're opening the door to the radical right-wingers because they're going to come in and say, okay, no problem, right. we'll play identity politics, but I'm not losing. How's that? Right. It's like, well, that isn't the way you're supposed to play. You're supposed to be guilty. It's like, no, sorry, I'm not well, going to be guilty. Is, I'm just going to be dominant. Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is the danger of the, the actual alt-right because what the alt-right mm -hmm. is, it's a reactionary identity politics movement. Yeah. And the left doesn't want to acknowledge its own role in helping to drive the, the emergence of, an, of a reactionary identity politics mm -hmm. movement, which, by the way, I find despicable because I think all identity politics movements yeah. are despicable. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I think, too. Yeah. I don't care I mean, if it's I did, right or left. I, I did a year of shows on if the left doesn't clean them. And when I was still saying I'm on yeah. the left, if we don't clean up our house what is going to happen mm -hmm. and look what has happened mm -hmm. so shifting slightly a little bit I thought this would be interesting is there a criticism actually I'll, I'll start with you first mm -hmm. on this one is there a criticism of you that you think is the most legit no criticism of me is legit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know I, I think that the the criticism of me that I think is legit is one that I think is probably common to most people, which is I, I tend to fall into confirmation bias, which is true for everybody. Uh, so, you know, I think that, but it, you know, when you're in the political realm, the easiest thing to do is to find evidence that supports your position and cherry pick the evidence in order to support that position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so if the idea is that I tend to do that, I try to fight that, but I'll acknowledge that that's a flaw that I have, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, you know, when you're, when you're invested in a political fight, that the easy, that, that, your easiest mode of confrontation is to find stuff that supports what you already think as opposed to taking in all of the available evidence and then shifting your viewpoint as we were talking about before uh, toward, the, toward the right position. Uh, it's, 
because I think it is a weakness, it's something that I that I try to fight as often as possible, and uh, I try to make provision for that. But. So, so before I ask you yours, um, what, what, what do you I th think? What, is what, wrong do you, with ben? what do you think? A, what do you think is wrong with Ben? And B, what do you think is psychologically the best way to deal with that? To be to be aware, right? You're being aware of what your issues, limitations are, what your biases might be. Oh, it's but to psychologically, just, what's oh, the best way to? Oh, it's just surround yourself with competent people who who have their areas of expertise that aren't yours and to listen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's helped me over the last 15 months because I've had about 10 people around me. Five of them are family members, about five of them are friends who are extraordinarily competent people and they go over what I've been doing and they don't pull any punches. This feelings thing, this mm -hmm. is something I'd like to spring to your defense about because the rule, if you don't have an ethic, is don't hurt anyone's feelings. It's like, okay, but which feelings do you mean? <laughs> do you mean like this second's feelings? Or do you mean the person's well-being across a year? Mm -hmm. Because lots of times when you're having a firm discussion with someone that upsets them in the present, this happens with children all the time, is you're, you're not taking stock of their feelings at the moment, ex except insofar as you have to, because you want to help prevent them from cascading into catastrophe for the rest of their life. It's right. like, well, I'm going to discipline you right now. I'm going to tell you why you were wrong. We're going to have a hard conversation. Because if you keep that up, your life is going to be a never-ending stream of misery. Well, that's not cruel. And so, but because people don't see the ethic of iterated games, let's say, mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. like that, they say, well, you just shouldn't hurt anybody's feelings in the moment. It's like, well, that's, no. Well, th this, is, this is why I think both you and I object to the, the whole idea of the pleasure-pain matrix being the, the, the thing that matters in terms of human happiness. Right. And because the bottom line is that you may be experiencing a good deal of pain right now, but that's going to lead to a more fulfilled right. life. That's the utility of sacrifice. Right, right, exactly. Everyone knows that. Give up something now in a rather painful way and you may benefit in the future. Yeah, pain, the pain pleasures ethic doesn't work because of the problem of time. Exactly. A, and time and other people, that's another reason it doesn't work. So it's, yeah, you need a way more sophisticated solution to that. So, so now let's turn that question to you. What do you think is the most legit criticism that you see? Because I see a lot of blue check, you know, Twitter people with 5,000 followers just attacking you. Yeah. Very rarely about your ideas. Oh, they'll, they'll just make up something. Jordan Peterson says dogs are blue and cats are green. Yeah. You know, and then uh, uh, somebody, somebody basically did that and I invited him on the show to talk to you and then of course he disappeared. Well, I, have, <laughs> but, I would say I have some problem with mood regulation, you know, and so sometimes I'm more irritable than I should be. Sometimes I'm more, I'm, I come across, well, no, I probably am more angry than is optimal in the circumstance, you know. I mean, one of the rules of English common law, for example, is that you're more or less allowed to, def to defend yourself with minimum necessary force. And I've had to practice and practice and practice <laughs> to use minimum necessary yeah. force. You really want to hit him right now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, so and then, like, that's... No, that is the temptation. I mean, no, mm. I, think we, I think we all struggle with that. Yeah. I mean, there, there are certain times where somebody says something, it's like, oh, I just, oh... I mean, it's, there, there are certain questions that get asked, and it's, it's just a slow pitch softball right down the center right, of the plate. Right. It's like, do I need to do I need to hit this softball as hard as I possibly can? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, especially, yeah, yeah. it's especially rough if you have a sense of humor too, because right. you think, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yes, zing, you know. Right. But it's it's really useful, and I have learned this. It's really useful to not defend yourself too vociferously. Which is weird, because you'd think, mm -hmm. well, you have the right to defend yourself, like, no, all, no holds barred. It's like, no, it actually doesn't work that way. Yeah. It's that you have to defend yourself with minimal necessary force. And I think I managed that in the Channel 4 interview. For Thank sure. God. Yeah. But, I mean, believe me, people have been talking to me about that nonstop for 15 months, and I'm listening. And I'm by listening. the way, it wouldn't work as well if you hadn't done that. Right? If you just shellacked her. Mm -hmm. Right. If you if you just gone right at her and said what you are saying is so stupid for these five reasons, yep. <laughs> it would it would have been bad. I think. I think the I fact think so that, the, the fact that you sat there and you just said no, you're asking good questions, and you know the fact that you're asking good questions demonstrates the invalidity of your entire viewpoint. Yeah. <laughs> and well, that that was much more effective. Mm -hmm. well, right. Me, right. Well, not see see one of the things I've been meditating on for the last year is there's a line in the New Testament that says resist not evil. I think okay, what okay, what the hell are you supposed to do with that <laughs> line? It's like. Because it's really a difficult thing to figure out. Do you really mean that? You don't resist evil? Well, there's a couple of problems. Is If you punch back, then you have a fight. Well, but you can't just not defend yourself, mm -hmm. like weakly. You can't be mm -hmm. weak and not defend yourself. But you can be strong 
and defend yourself minimally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a real art. Like that's, that's the essence of sophistication, I would say. Yeah. And like, I'm not, you know, I come from kind of a rough place. I come from Northern Alberta. I come from the frontier, you know? Yeah. And my town was scraped out of the bloody prairie 50 years before people moved, before, before I lived there. And so uh, it's, it's been an, it's been a continual challenge to adjust my sophistication to the level of challenge. And I, I'm trying to do that, and, do you think but that, I don't always manage it. Yeah, so to that point, do you think that we sometimes actually, at a deep level, use identity politics against ourselves in, in this regard? So you're sitting across from Kathy, she's female. Yeah. At some level, do you think you maybe moderated it because of that? Because had it been a male, you know, and, and you talk about this often, that we have to act differently towards males and females, and there's, a physical, there's physical reasons for that and biological reasons for that. But that had she been a male, say, say the same exact age from you, from Alberta, and yeah. all of that, that perhaps your response might have been a little more forceful. It's, even, it's, even though you're, we're, we're all agreeing your response was done correctly and, yeah. and even-handedly. Yeah, well, I, it's hard to say, but probably yes. You That's know, interesting. Well, because, you did, like, I, can't, I don't think that you can say that you fight with a woman the same way that you fight with a man. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't fight with a woman. It doesn't mean you shouldn't. But I don't think the rules are the same. Now, why are the rules different? Well, some of the rules are there's a physical limit that's much more stringent, right? I mean, there's a level of hinting at physical threat that you can bring to bear in a conversation between men that you cannot bring to bear in a conversation with a woman. Mm -hmm. So, and the me mechanics of that are very, very subtle and difficult. And it's especially challenging in an intellectual discussion because an intellectual discussion is a kind of war and it isn't obvious how men and women should go to war with one another. We don't know, we don't know how to sort that out. Mm -hmm. um, you, my sense has been on the panels that I've done is that I definitely have to pull my punches if I'm on a panel with women. It doesn't mean that I don't, it doesn't mean that it's any less challenging intellectually, but the, st the strategy and the attitude has to be different. It's much more likely that you'll be seen as a bully if you bring the same force to bear on a female opponent as you would on a male opponent. Yeah, so I wonder Rick if Lazio you're- Rick and Hillary Clinton is a perfect example of this in the political sphere. You remember back in 2000, Hillary was running for Senate in New York, and Rick Lazio walked across the stage and asked her to sign a piece of paper. And people, like the headlines oh, were that he, he basically was... assaulted her, right? Mm -hmm. Where if Rick Lazio had walked across the stage from another man and said, sign this piece of paper, been like, what a tough guy, look at that. He's yeah. willing to stand up to him. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's just so, the way so that So I works, suspect yeah. in that case, your answer to this question is no. You would treat people the same. If, if Piers Morgan that night had been female, you would have done the exact same thing. Well, I mean, I, I, was, I was actually relatively polite to peers. So it, 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 to me, it's, I, I try to be as polite as possible unless the person is being very impolite, in which case I'm happy to go impolite. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I try to, instead of trying to gauge sort of the, uh, probably we're doing the same thing, just from different directions. Instead of trying to you know, determine how I engage with the person by all of the various you know, I, I let them take the first punch, basically. You take the first step in the waltz and then I'll respond in kind. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you wanna, if you wanna act polite, then I'm happy to act polite with you and I'm happy to have a nice cordial conversation. If you wanna get nasty, then we'll get nasty and we'll do that and I prep for interviews. So I'm happy, <laughs> if you wanna go in the mud, I'm happy to go in the mud, we can mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I wanna circle back to something related to religion uh, that, we, that I wanted to get to earlier, but we're, we're doing a lot here. Um, do you think there's any difference, or do you both think there's any difference, Ben's belief in, or Ben's Jewish and your belief is Christian, mm -hmm. comes from the Chris, Christian tradition. Yeah. Does that matter at all? The, the, whatever differences there are in that little place where you're both saying, you know, we see the reasons why our morals and ethics and all that come from this, we're also acknowledging, uh, you know, the, the real world and, and biology and all of those things, Whatever differences you may have, which I don't even know that we that any of the three of us know what those differences yeah. are, do they even matter? They might. I, that would be a lovely. I, I'd thing love to, to figure out if there, if there are. If there yeah. are. Yeah, I mean, it depends. For for me, it depends on the brand of religion that, that a person is is espousing. So yeah. So let's I mean, just let's just do this with, with sure. you two. I mean. I mean, so my, my feeling. I'm, I'm writing a book on this right now, actually. Uh, so it, I, I, there are certain principles that obviously undergird Christianity that are from the Judaic tradition. I yeah. mean, it, Clearly, the first know, it's like five, a manifestation of the prophetic tradition. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's 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 essentially an attempt to merge 
Jerusalem with Athens is, is I think, the, the Book of John is the most obvious example using the logos as, as sort of the unifying feature mm -hmm. and, and writing the whole thing in Greek, right? I mean, that was not the, 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 the lingua franca of the, of the time. That was not what people were speaking, uh, except in educated circles. So um, all the Judaic principles, things like a, a God involved in history, a God who cares about individuals, uh, the notion that you have a choice between good and evil, so choose good, mm -hmm. uh, and that, and so that you will live long on the earth, right? The, all these things were taken forward into Christianity. The major distinctions in terms of, of Christianity versus Judaism are, are the idea that, and again, it depends on your interpretation of Christianity. Early Christianity sort of suggested that history had ended with Christ. Uh, and then in later kind of iterations of Christianity, that was moved beyond, right? It wasn't that history had ended. It was that Christ would come back when history had reached its logical progression. The progression of history didn't end, but the original messianism was, this is the Messiah, we're done, right? History's mm -hmm. over. It was a millennialist religion. Right, that's so what depends on very the, few people think that now. That's right, right. So, yeah. the, so this is why I'm trying to distinguish you know, brands of Christianity, because obviously there's serious differences, even in basic root level, between Catholicism and Calvinism and Lutheranism, and all, all these things have different iterations. So you know, my very strong belief in free will and my actual building of a moral system and Judaism's building a moral system on the notion of free will obviously runs directly counter to, for example, Calvinism. Mm -hmm. right? Calvinism suggests that free will is, is chimerical and there's no basis for it and uh, that God grants you grace based on what he wants to do. So it depends on, on the brand of Christianity, but I think that overall the conflict between Christianity and Judaism in large measure is, especially in the early conflict, was political rather than ideological in a lot of ways. Uh, it was a new religion attempting to establish its own footing and was angry that, that Jews would not join this new religion and leave behind tradition. I think that there, there are certain ways in which Christianity, you know, like for example, the, the, the main distinction between Christianity and Judaism that people usually make is that Christianity is a grace-based religion and Judaism is an acts-based religion. Meaning that Judaism says you sort of earn your way into heaven, right? You earn your way toward a better life. Uh, and, and Christianity says if you believe, Right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you believe, then you're good. But mm -hmm. the truth is that Christianity sort of backdoors the, the Judaic view by saying, if you really do believe, then you're going to act in these particular right. ways that That's demonstrate right. your belief. Yeah, well, right? there's this weird paradoxical relationship between the idea of belief in Christianity, the belief that, that Christ came to save everyone from their sins, and that all you have to do is admit that, and you're redeemed. Like, there's symbolic truth to that that would take a long time to unpack. But there's also an injunction that goes along with that to imitate Christ in your right. life. Exactly. Right? So it's like, so, well, I feel like more. a lot of these distinctions are, are almost uh, some of them are, are almost a little false. I mean, mm -hmm. meaning that they're, they're either Christian misreads of Judaism or Jewish misreads of, of Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and that when you get to the root of it, I mean, this is what Maimonides says that there are significant differences <clears throat> between Judaism and Christianity. But his view of Christianity from a Jewish historical point of view is that Judaism was never bound to convert billions of people around the world, but Christianity was specifically because. We have a lot of crap we got to do. I mean, Jews have, like, we have 613 commandments. Yeah. You know, we got to, we, we have to keep kosher. We have to do all of these things. I appreciate and, you doing a lot of them for me. Yeah, no, no problem. I'm, I'm taking care of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll transfer over the points yeah. in the afterlife. I assume someone's <laughs> I'll give you one of my afterlives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that Christianity ends up doing a lot of those same things that, you know, there were supposed to be stark distinctions just under different guys. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, th this is why, in the modern world, when the discrimination between, you know, from Christians toward Jews largely has, has ended, I think that what you're seeing is this tremendous confluence between particularly Orthodox Jews and observant Christians mm -hmm. on, matters of, on matters of values. Uh, because once Christianity in the late 20th century, in the mid 20th century, in, in America more broadly with Christianity, because American Christianity is very different than European Christianity. Once, once there was an idea that Jews were not the enemy to be converted, but were maybe you still want to convert me, but we're not going to come at you with a knife. We're going to come at you with a book. Yeah. And that we share a common framework for how the world is supposed to work. You just may not agree with the second half of the book. Right. And then I think that that's, that's created a, a pretty good working relationship with, uh, I, I'm, I, this is why I'm struggling to come up with what are the significant differences. And so well, I, 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 need, the, I, need well, a, I need a Christian to tell me what is the significant well, difference I, my, so I can argue with my it. My question. Because I know my own religion better than my, I know Christianity. My question has been, I, I don't know if the role that the state plays in Judaism and Christianity is the same. Because I'm not sure what to make of the, like what I would say is the Jews put a tremendous amount of emphasis on the state as a mechanism for salvation, something like that. That might be the symbolic idea that underlies the establishment of Israel. And I would say that in Christianity... Do you mean the nation or you mean like the government? I mean the nation. But, right. but then it gets tangled up with the government. Right. right? right. So, so, so 
So the, the, right, this is a distinction that, Ju that Christianity is a universal, universalistic religion, right? Yeah. The idea is that it, that in the kingdom of God, everyone is Christian, basically, and Judaism is not in one sense, but it is in another, which is that. God identifies a nation that he treasures as his own, and he has a special relationship with that nation, but Judaism is not exclusivist with regard to who gets into heaven. So there's this, there's this basic idea in, uh, in Genesis that there are commandments that are given prior to the giving of the Torah. Right? Mm -hmm. that there's the, what we call the Sheva Mitzvah Pnei Noach, the seven commandments that are given to the sons of Noah, meaning all mankind. And these are things like no murder, no idolatry, no adultery. They basically mirror a lot of the Ten Commandments. And so the idea in Judaism is that God, it's almost like a priestly caste. God chose this specific group of people to be a light unto the nations by demonstrating what a godly lifestyle looks like if you dedicate every aspect of your life to God. And then he said to everybody else, I know not everybody else is up to this, and, I, and in fact, Judaism are supposed to try and turn away converts, but, if you, but you can still get into heaven. The idea that, that we are trying to force anyone into, into being Jewish, that, that's not a thing. So nationalism without well, the you, conversion... Well, you can think about that psychologically as an attempt to both manage the preservation of group identity, mm -hmm. so that would be culture, a cultural right. identity which has some utility, and also to be able to coexist with others who are right. doing things in a different way. And again, Judaism has had a, a long history of, of, just like every other religion, of sort of evolution on this stuff. Right? Like when you read the, Bush of the book of Joshua, there's actual forced conversion that happens in the book of Joshua. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to uh, mid, early Christianity and midpoint Judaism, right, because Judaism is a lot older than Christianity, then you're already talking about Jews who are not looking to convert people. Uh, they sort of want to live in their own state. Uh, they don't want to bother anyone else for the most part. Uh, so the idea of like a tidal wave of conquering Jews going out, I mean, even to think about it now is hilarious, right? right. Nobody thinks about it that mm -hmm. way, except mm -hmm. if you're right. a conspiratorial nutbag. <laughs> but <it's, laughs> but the Inquisitions usually work the other way. That, that, that's right. That's, so yeah. it's, so but, but so, so any, anything that you might have heard Ben just say, would any thing jive with a, a fundamental belief that you have that would cause a problem. You know what I mean? Like cause, well, it, cause I, a problem I think, in, I think the, in society Well, I think that one potential problem that's, that's worth discussing, but it would take forever to discuss it, is the relative role of the individual versus the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see this argued out in the prophetic books in, in the Old Testament. Yes. I mean, there's the Jewish state, mm -hmm. and it's, it's sort of the, the central player in some sense, but there's clear evidence that it can become corrupt, it can fall away, mm -hmm. and that a prophet who's an individual has to step forward and re revivify it, mm -hmm. right? And so there's tremendous emphasis on the utility of the individual. And you see that in Juda Judaism, I would say, overall, it's, it's, a, it's a very cohesive, it, 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 it well, promotes in-group cohesion, let's say, but it also allows for individual expression in a very interesting ways because mm. there's tremendous emphasis in Jewish culture on learning and, and articulation and mastery of ideas. And so that provides this space for the individual to flourish. With Christianity, you see more of a move away, I would say, from the idea of the state. Now, that's not necessarily without its troubles. One of the things Jung pointed out was, well, as Christianity becomes more about the individual, the religion itself tends to fragment like it did with Protestantism until it just fragments right to the point where every individual is their own church. And then you have no continuity and no tradition. And the Catholics were kind of a bulwark against that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's a discussion to be had about the relative role of the individual in redeeming the world, let's say, versus the state in redeeming the world. And I would say the Christians come down more strongly on the side of the individual and the Jews come down more strongly on the side of the state. Yeah. Now, like, I'm willing to be corrected about that because yeah. I've never actually been able to have a discussion with anyone about that. <laughs> so I, well, I don't know what I mean, you I think, think about I think, that. I think there's some truth to that. I mean, I think the idea of, you know, in, in Hebrew, Am Yisrael, like the idea of the nation of Israel being paramount. And when you pray, you pray in collective terms. You don't pray in individual terms. Everything is is done in terms of anachnu, in terms of we, praying as a group, right? You're mm -hmm. supposed to pray in a minion. So how do you really both square yourself. that away, uh, in your own ways? How do you square that away as someone because that believes in the individual? Because there's a lot of play in the, the joints. Yeah. There's a lot of play in the joints, meaning that, uh, so for example, to take the most to take the most obvious example, if you, if you want to talk about the power of the Jewish state uh, in, in sort of biblical context, there's tremendous argument between whether a kingship is a good thing or a kingship is a bad thing right, in the right. Old Testament, right? right? I mean, it says, it says, like Samuel warns the Jewish people, if you take a king, here's what's gonna happen. It's all gonna suck, mm -hmm. right? And then they form a kingship and things suck. Mm -hmm. And so there's a strong case to be made that kingship was not actually what was wanted because you have an entire period of just judges and the judges are legitimately just individuals who are trusted by the people, but then they can be supplanted at any time by another judge who's not from the lineage. So, you know, th so when we say that 
that group identity matters in Judaism. It matters to the extent that you're following God's law. But if you stray away from that, the idea, I, I think Judaism has always said that what you do is what makes you part of the group, not what you are. So Judaism has a weird dichotomy in it. Uh, that's largely driven by exigent circumstances, which is the idea of biological Judaism versus the idea of religious Judaism. Mm -hmm. So I care very little about biological Judaism. Like when somebody says, you know, somebody, such and such is Jewish, Noam Chomsky is Jewish, like so yeah. what? I, I, I really don't care. And, mm -hmm. and I think that m most Orthodox Jews, we basically biological Judaism or your mom was Jewish, it, which is the way that it works uh, in Orthodox Judaism, is, the, is sort of the entry ticket to being Jewish, meaning you have to either have converted in or your mom has to be Jewish in order for you to become fully Jewish. But the practice is what matters to me more than anything else. And that's where you get back into grace-based versus acts-based a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Well, it's also, that's another place where the, the group identity issue becomes paramount. It's like, well, there's this group, well, how is membership defined? Well, let's say it's, mem it's defined by ethnicity, something like mm -hmm, that, which mm -hmm. would be related to the descent through the mother. It's like, well, that's a problem. I'm not saying right. it's wrong. I'm saying it's a problem no, it, it because is, it, it is demarcates a, a group. You say, mm -hmm. well, this is a group that only we can belong to. But what's weird is you can convert in. Mm -hmm. right? So, right, so, right. so this, this, is the, when, this is why I say when there's play in the joints, mm -hmm. a lot of the problems are solvable through the idea that you can convert in. Mm -hmm. So Judaism says you can't convert out, but then we don't punish people who leave, right? But is it, right. But, it which right. is different than Islam. Yes. Um, but the, yes, it's actually a relatively important thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's right. Point out. Um, yeah. But... but I mean, and one of the people who I work with at, at my company, Andrew Clavin, is a guy who was born Jewish and now is Christian. Yeah. Right? So in my view, he's Jewish, but am I going to like drag him down to my synagogue? Like, that's not a thing. Right, uh, right. So it's, it's, but uh, I think that what, what the group identity, the, the, good, the, the one thing I will say for group identity is that what we have seen is that if there is lack of group identity, that group identity is filled usually by nefarious groups, meaning that, mm -hmm. that people do have a necessity, the idea of existing that you, you find your meaning or you find your purpose or you find your identity just in yourself as an individual is not only wrong, it's belied by virtually all of human history. Careful, uh, you're going to uh, make an argument for identity politics. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, that's but, but, why but, I wanted to ask this question. Right. No, but, the, but, the, but the point that, but, but what Judaism does, what America does, mm. it says find your identity in the ideas. Yeah. Mm. Right, that's the difference. Is when I'm, this is why I say I don't care about biological Judaism, you mm -hmm. know, particularly. That I, I care much more about the ideas that you hold. So I'm in favor of group identity if group identity is built around a set of ideas that are worth preserving. I'm not in favor of group mm -hmm. identity. It, like, I am a conservative. That's a group identity. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's yes. an identifier more than it's an identity, meaning it's, it's, it's a way of identifying me as a person who thinks this way. And because I think there are differences in, in modes of thought, then those group identities do matter. I mean, this is why we get together. This is why we have discussions. This is why, why we, we have, have friends, families. right? This yeah. is why we have families. Yeah, so. yeah. But I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that the way you did because I, I try to challenge myself on that all the time because I talk about the individual. I believe in the individual. And I want yeah. to make sure that I'm not occasionally going But if we can find commonality, of, if we can find, and this is what I think is one of the things that's broken down, is we used to have a common purpose. Like, I, I have yeah. this framework that I'm working on in, in the book that I'm writing, where I basically say that in order for an individual to be happy, you need, you need four things. You need individual purpose. You need individual capacity, like a feeling that you can accomplish that purpose, or at least make moves in, in that direction. You need a communal purpose. You do need mm -hmm. to feel yep. like you're part yep. of a group that's moving in the right direction, and you need communal capacity, which both allows the community to activate together, mm -hmm. and also protects your rights as an individual to do what you want to do in pursuit of your individual purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's the apotheosis of happiness, and that's what I think the Founding Fathers were trying to do in the United yeah, States, for right. example, set up a framework where you could fulfill all of these things. But you do need the idea of communal purpose. And one of the things that's happened post-Enlightenment is that people don't even think in terms of, they either think purely in terms of communal purpose, or not at all in terms of communal purpose. So mm -hmm. they think either purely in terms of communal purpose, and that's identity politics, meaning I'm black, therefore yeah. the black community should do X, right. right? or I'm Jewish, therefore the Jewish community should do X. And then there are people who think not in terms of communal purpose at all, meaning full-on libertarian, I make my own meaning, we don't have to have anything in common, mm -hmm. we, and, and that's a lie. Even libertarians believe we have to have an idea of liberty in common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, and they have to live with other people, uh, right? Exactly. Yeah, harmoniously. And when we don't, and when we don't have any of the, when we don't have any sort of communal purpose, when we live with a bunch of people with whom we share nothing, then it, it falls apart incredibly quickly. Okay. Like, so, so here's here's how the Christian drama looks to me. It, it, it addresses this issue, right? So, Christ is presented as a figure who's an absolute master of his tradition, right? He's debating with the Jewish elders when he's twelve. So. Think about it psychologically. Is first you're a child and you're dependent on your parents, and then you have to make the move from being a child dependent into the world. But you don't move from child to individual. You move from child to group. 
That's your teenage gang. That's your adolescence. You have to catalyze your group identity. If you don't have a group identity, it's actually a developmental failure, hmm. right? But then you might think, well, wait a second. Group identity is necessary, but is it the highest is it, it, does it represent the highest plane of moral achievement? The answer to that is no. You have to emerge from your group as an individual. Okay, so now, this is how I read the Christian story symbolically, and this is a consequence mostly of having stu studied Jung. He said, look, you need group identity. That's the persona that you wear. You have to have a persona. You have to be able to wear a suit. You have to be, you have to simplify yourself for other people. You have to be able to play the game. Right. Otherwise, you're, you just have failed developmentally. But if you're only a persona, then that's a big problem, partly because when the group goes insane, so do you. Uh -huh. Okay, now you've got to emerge out of the group. Okay, so now you need a symbol for what emerges out of the group. Okay, so Christ is the symbol of what should emerge out of the group, speaking psychologically. Bear the tragedy of life, speak the truth, be willing to transform through death. That's the rules. Now, I'm speaking purely psychologically. You learn something new. You learn it. It makes you suffer. The part of you that's wrong has to die. You have to let go of that. And it's hard, especially mm -hmm. maybe you learn something profound. It's like, it's like you have to regrow an arm. It's really painful, you know. But you identify with the part of yourself that transforms through voluntary acceptance of suffering. Yeah. And that's what Christ represents as a symbol. And I think that that's... I think that that's correct symbolically. This is what actually severed the relationship between Jung and Freud, by the way, because Jung laid out the, his understanding of Christianity in those terms. And Freud, it wasn't a Jewish Christian thing, mm -hmm. though, because Freud was really, he, he was Jewish by ethnicity, yeah, but right. not by not Jew, practice. Right. No, not at yeah. all. He just didn't want to have anything to do with religious ideation at all. He right. thought that that would introduce, he called it like a tidal wave, a black tidal wave of occultism back into what he regarded as a science. He had his point. But I think Jung got the symbolic structure right. And so, what does that mean in relationship to Christianity and Judaism? Well, it's really complicated because you have the prophetic tradition in Judaism and the prophets are also symbols of people who emerge from the pathological group, who step forward courageously, and who reconstitute the group. Yeah. And so so you, you believe these people could exist right now? Which, which people? The, the prophets. I think prophets the, of uh, sorts uh, exist always. Yeah. I think Dostoevsky was a prophet. Nietzsche was clearly a prophet. I mean, he predicted what was going to happen yeah. in the 20th century. Yeah. Can you imagine predicting well, what's going to happen in the 20th century? Because I think when people, I, I, well, the reason century? I asked it like that was because I think when people, when you say prophets, I think people think of like someone coming down from heaven and they're right. going to have a halo on or something, mm -hmm. you know, some crazy Basically, thing. But, but you think that, th that's why I was trying to get to the realism, why, which yeah, is what you're talking about. I actually about. fully agree with this. In fact, so does Maimonides. I mean, Maimonides has an entire section in Guide for the Perplexed about prophecy. And what he says is there's Moses' level prophecy, which is the, the legislating prophet, which is, and he says he's the only legislating prophet in, in the Jewish view. But all the other prophets are just people who see things incredibly clearly, essentially. Yeah. They're people who have studied philosophy and who have studied human morality mm -hmm. and have studied the human being. And then that's And they're what, way down on the iceberg. That's right. That's if, the thing that makes them different. Exactly. And, and so in that sense, people who... Predicting the, the thing about, you know, providing a certain level of stability for folks. And we're, you know, I think, I think there are levels of prophecy is what I'll say. And I think mm -hmm. that the, the better you are at, at recognizing human behavior and the interplay of forces, the better you are at saying, okay, here's what's going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult for anybody to say, here's what's going to happen in 100 years, because if you could predict that, you'd make a lot in the stock market. But I think <laughs> that you could certainly, uh, you know, as you... Well, you can also get a sense of plate tectonics. Right. Like, the details rub out, but, like, and I think that's where we're at now. Like, I believe we're in, we are in a war of ideas. Yeah. We're, we're, we're... We're at a point where we're debating the validity of postmodernism. Now, and that's tainted with neo-Marxism, and that should have been laid to rest a hundred years ago, but we're wasn't. Trying, we're trying. Yeah, well, I mean, because, <laughs> because that, that just... I mean, the reason that the postmodernists can't let go of neo-Marxism is because there's no impetus forward in postmodernism. Mm -hmm. that's, that's its fundamental flaw. It's like, well, there's no grand narrative. It's okay, like, what are you going to do tomorrow? <laughs> well, I don't know, because everything's the same as everything else. It's like, well, you can't live, you cannot live that way. It's impossible to live that way. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll just sneak some Marxism in the back door. It's like, well, that's, that's prima facie evidence, in my estimation, that your philosophy is pragmatically lacking. Mm -hmm. Even though you can make a perfectly coherent right. case for it, it's like you can't live it out. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So you have to sneak in this pathological Marxism in the back door. Well, no, that just invalidates your entire system. But 
Apart from all that, I think the postmodern objection to meaning is actually wrong. Well, we, we talked about this earlier. I do believe that there's a transcendent ethic. And I do believe that it touches on the metaphysical. I believe that people experience that because people are perfectly capable of having unutterably profound religious experiences. And the naturalistic materialists don't know what the hell to do with that. They have no idea what to do with that fact. Say, well, it's delusional. It's like, well, hang on a sec. People who have those experiences appear to be more successful and healthier. Mm -hmm. It's like, so in exactly in what manner is that delusional? And if you induce it in the lab with psilocybin, for example, among people who are dying of cancer, their fear of death goes away. It's like, that's, you're going to just lay, lay that out there as delusional, are you? They'll quit smoking. 85% success rate with one mystical experience on psilocybin produces 85% cessation rate in smoking. Yeah. It's completely, and with uh, MDMA, ecstasy, mm -hmm. The three treatments with MDMA, that's what the current research indicates, produces a 72% cure rate for intractable post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. It's like, those are miracle cures and no one, and they have to be accompanied by the mystical experience. No one knows how to account for that. And so there so is it's a, a transcendent so it's a very ethic. So it's a very physical thing. I mean, in a case mm -hmm. like that, you talk about ayahuasca or any of these things, right? The, you're eating something, mm -hmm. you're ingesting something, smoking it, whatever it is. It's physical, it's here and now, but the experience is, is, metaphysical. is metaphysical. Sure, that's a place where the biological and the transcendent touch, and we don't know what to make of that. Yeah. Well, that's why psychedelics threw our whole culture into such a, such a, flip this upside down. No one knew what to do with them. You know, I mean, the Indians regarded psilocybin as food of the gods for a reason. And, yeah. and when, when people have encountered psychedelic substances throughout human history, that's always how they've been characterized. Yeah. It's right, food of the gods. It's like, beware of them but they're, they open the door to the transcendent. And, well, I think the evidence that they are doing something, that psychedelic substances are doing something that we seriously don't understand at all, no. not a bit, is overwhelming. Rick Strassman wrote a book on his experiences giving DMT to a whole bunch of people down in, he was at, in Austin, I think. And Strassman's a pretty straight scientist, you know, he was interested in measuring psychophysiological responses to the drugs. Well, he'd give people DMT and they all came back with the same story. I was blasted out of my consciousness. I went, I met a whole bunch of alien beings. Uh -huh. They were really surprised I was there. <laughs> and then I came back and it was the most real thing that's ever happened to me. And Strassman would say, well, you know, well, you had a Jungian archetypal experience or it was a dream. And they'd say, you don't you understand. Yeah. And he got so distraught because of these continual reports that he had stopped doing the research. Yeah, and it, like, I'm not making a claim for, a, for anything metaphysical here, but I'm definitely pointing out that there are undeniable realms of human experience that involve religious experience and a sense of the infinite transcendent that look like they're healthy and that you cannot deny. Yeah. Well, so what are you supposed to do with that? You, well, you so put they, it in a box and you say, well, we're not going to pay attention to it. It's like, that's not going to work. Yeah, that's not going to work. And I've done a lot of those things that you just mentioned and virtually always had good experiences on them. Now, as someone that I'm pretty sure has never smoked weed, no, I've never you haven't eaten drugs, mushrooms, yeah. you haven't, no, okay, done, you you haven't done MDMA yeah, and, and all barely, that stuff. I barely will take a drink, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've done all of those things. I don't really do, well, I mean, I smoke some weed, but I don't, I'm not doing, I haven't done ecstasy in years. And, and mushrooms I did do about a year ago. And I had a great day and I kind of wandered <laughs> around and, and I thought, I, you know, I felt so some, some things happening. I didn't, I, when I did them in college, I had a couple of those type of transcendent feeling. I was just part of something, whatever. But, so when you hear all this, mm -hmm. as someone that doesn't partake in any of this stuff, uh, what do you make of, of that? That people can perhaps use some substances that you're not down mm -hmm. with on a personal level to get to a place that I think you actually think is a good place. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer is that it depends on you know, the level of expertise of the person using it is what I would suggest, you know, the idea, like I'm not against prescription medication. So if you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, an actual program that's gonna better somebody's life, right. that's one thing. But if it's somebody who's just, I wanna have a religious experience, let me pop some LSD. Right. Uh, then there, there's some serious downsides to drugs that I, I, I do wonder if it is necessary. Well, two things. One, uh, in, in, in Judaism, and I keep reverting back to this because I know it's the religion I know, um, but there, there's two kind of schools of thought with regard to Judaism. One are, are called the, uh, the, the Misnagdim, 
Uh, these are people who are sort of enlightenment mentality, hard science folks, and they're the Hasidim. And the Hasidim are the people who you see for like Chabad. They have the, the big beards and they have the payas, uh, and, they, and they like to dance and they drink on, on Purim and, and all this. And they're, they're wonderful people. And they, they do great outreach specifically because they're so spiritual. And I tend to be more of a snagid than a, than a Hasid, meaning that mm-hmm. uh, it's, uh, I, I try I to get like to, to my... I like to see you dance. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not, it's not pretty. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I try to get to spirituality through reason as opposed to through experience Mm -hmm. Uh, simply because I think that well I know people who have had religious experience and it's really changed them Mm -hmm. I think there are also a lot of people who have religious experience and it lasts for a given amount of time and then they're done with the religious experience and they just go back to doing whatever they're doing right I mean this is what you were doing in college so I think that if you're looking for that as a gateway out of whatever it is that is troubling you in terms of a lack of purpose like a permanent solution Maybe that works for a small number of people, but I, I, I highly doubt that most people can find a level of purpose necessary to drive the entirety of the rest of their lives outside of a framework of conscious will moving them in the direction of doing the right thing. Jung told people, he talked about mescaline and LSD in the context of Huxley's introduction of those substances into the Western world. And he said two things in his inimitably wise manner. The first thing he said is, beware of unearned wisdom. <laughs> it's like, yeah, man, that's great. And he also said, you... You have to be very careful about about entering the realm of the gods because you end up with a responsibility that might be more crushing than you can tolerate. And it's the same kind of idea. And I thought, I've never read anyone who wrote wiser words about the dangers of psychedelic use than that. Because he didn't say, well, none of this is real. He said, it's more real than you want it to be. And so watch the hell out. And I think that's extremely good advice. And it is very difficult for people to integrate those experiences into their life. Although my experience with people has been, and I've seen this with lots of people, they've said that they've done mushrooms, for example, and had a mystical experience, and that that provided them with a moral compass that they lacked before that never went away. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to many people who've had that experience. So, But, you know, I've also been in Amsterdam watching the 50-year-old punk rockers trip out on mushrooms and, and beer and go pound out some street kid, you know. Yeah. Right. So there's the, the downside of transcendence is something that's not to be trifled with, and there's also the opportunity not to go to heaven but to go to hell. And that does happen to people, and that can, be, that can induce post-traumatic stress disorder, essentially. So, you know, beware of, beware of wandering in realms that exactly. you're not competent to wander in. The, 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 yeah, yeah that, that's, my, that's my central take. Is and the, I think the, it's really are... good for you. Like, I think that what you're doing really works because, you, you know, you, you do kind of what I did with the biblical lectures, except you take it to an even greater extreme, I would say. You're so rational in your approach. Like, people know that you have a religious overview, let's say. Mm-hmm. But you don't use that. You use it less than I do, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. And I, I think it really works well for you. I think it's very effective. Well, I mean, I think it's hard to force faith on people, and I don't think it's wrong to force faith on people. Well, it's so probably wanna... also counterproductive. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, I, I'm not preaching that you have to agree with how I got to these values to say that these values are necessary for the civilization. I mean, this is essentially what I've said to Sam when I was debating him, is, is you know, he said, well, you know, a lot of religious people, he sort of suggested that I, you know, think that atheists can't be moral people, and I said, I don't think that that's true at all. I mean, the point that I'm making is, you have to get to these values to have a civilization. How you get to those values, in my view, you know, I think requires a leap of faith. You can make that leap of faith a variety of different ways, but you're going to end up needing these central values at root if you're going to build a civilization off of that. So whether you do that through, you know, the, the kind of method that, that Sam wants to get to, what was weird is that, you know, Sam and I come from completely different perspectives on virtually everything, but we share probably 90 to 95 percent of our values. Yeah. And so what I would suggest mm-hmm. is that those values are rooted in a Judeo-Christian civilization that is mixed with a Greek civilization that brought us to the same place because we grew up five miles from each other. So of course we have the same values. Right. His, his counter argument to that basically would be that you're really talking about enlightenment values, but you would say those values ultimately came right, from exactly. Judeo-Christian values before You know, values the funny thing that. about that is that's actually a silly argument, that those are enlightenment well, values. Well, I hope you guys will talk well, about uh, well, this think, when you're on stage together I think together the biologists weeks, right? have already made short shrift of that. It's like Sam can't be an evolutionary biologist and say that the values that run Western civilization sprang from the Enlightenment. It's like you don't get to have those two time frames at the same time. I may have slightly been so, putting words in his yeah, mouth there. No, so no, no, wanna... no, 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 I, I, See, see yeah. I, I disagree with you a little bit about the atheist issue because I think this is the reason. It's like if you think about the layers of the mind, like mm-hmm. the, with the iceberg analogy, it's like, well, you've got your, 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 your patterns of action and then you've got your justification for those patterns of action. You might think that those are rational. But, but then there's something underneath that, which is like, 
the images that represent reality and the stories that represent reality and then there's something underneath that even mm -hmm. and I think that to be religious is to have all of those things in order simultaneously and I don't think that you can have an ethic that's only grounded in rationality because I think the integrity of that rationality depends on the totally integrity of stories that you don't understand no, so, that exist. So, so let me rephrase because I actually agree with everything you just said. When I say that we have to agree on these values in order for us to build a civilization, how you get there is your own business. I mean on an individual level. I don't mean that every way you get to those values is equally valid. Right? I think that uh, otherwise Sam and I would agree, right? <laughs> like, right. I, I do not think that the, the mode of thinking from evolutionary biology to the values that I think are necessary for building a civilization are even... See, then I, I see weaknesses coming up in Sam's representations for this reason. The first thing is he has to dispense with consciousness and he has to dispense with free will. And I actually think that's deeply problematic. And I think the reason he has to do that, and Dennett does it too, is because there is something metaphysically strange about consciousness. And you can't allow for that if you're a reductionist materialist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm more than willing to say, look, I, I don't understand consciousness at all. And the more I think about it, the less I understand it. Because it seems to be the linchpin of being. Without consciousness, there's no being. Right. You could say, well, the material reality continues. It's like, well... Maybe and maybe not, because we do not understand the relationship between time and space and consciousness. So there's no, it's not self-evident that what you're saying is true. It might be true, but even if it was true, well, exactly how does the universe that has no consciousness in it exist? Like, how do you parameterize it? Mm -hmm. Does it have a duration? Does it have a size? Does it right. have any qualities? Like, what is well, it? It's like a video game that no one's playing. Right, exactly. It's like, well, what is that exactly? Well, th this is this is where we get to, you know, back to that three-hour conversation that you and Sam had as to the nature of truth and what exactly truth is. And one of the things that I always, w I don't want to, you know, critique Sam's ideology without him here to defend himself. Although um, it's fun. It, it, it is definitely fun, but we'll have to have Sam in here to actually yeah. actually do that because it'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I've always found weird is that he and I have precisely the same notion of an objective truth, but it, I don't understand where he's getting his from. Meaning that, right. <laughs> like, I'm getting... Yeah, and I don't either. Like, well, and he also stresses... Because if you, if you, if you, if you base your viewpoint on a uh, materialist evolutionary biology, then what you, would success, what, what you would say is the truth is that which is most biologically successful. Mm -hmm. right? that, which that's is the claim I was making when I talked to Sam. Right, exactly, which is, mm -hmm. which is your claim, and also a claim that leads to religion, because biologically speaking, religious believers are more biologically successful than non-religious believers well, over also the course of religious, human history. religious belief evolved. Right. That's the thing. Not only did religious belief evolve, clearly it evolved. It's one of the human universals. The capacity for religious experience evolved. Well, you might say, why? Well, maybe you could, you could take the viewpoint that seems to be characteristic of Steven Pinker and say, well, it's a spandrel. It's just a side effect of something more substantial. And my objection to that is, Define your spandrels first. Right, exactly. You don't get to this define right. them post-hoc, exactly right. you know? You don't, you, don't get to, right. you, don't, you don't get to define away the side effects of the drug. Right, right. right. It, 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 exactly. It, That's it, exactly it. it. it, it yeah, when, yeah. The, you know, my, when people talk about drugs, very often what they'll do is they'll say, well, you know, the drug is for a headache, but it has the side effect of causing you cancer. Right. And it's like, well, no, the drug causes cancer. Yeah. Right? Right. It's not a side effect. Right. Yeah. It's not right, a side, right. Maybe the getting rid of the headache is the side effect. Every, I mean, every one of those prescription commercials, you know, headache, diarrhea, nausea, thoughts of suicide, et cetera, et cetera. But your cough might go. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. nuts. All right. Here's what I want to do. So I want to be very respectful of, of both of your times, but yours particularly, because you're uh, doing like a two-hour lecture tonight at the Orpheum. There might be a surprise guest there. I don't want to say who. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to do a half half hour more if you guys can do that. Okay. We're gonna do uh, Q&A from, from the audience, but I do wanna ask you guys one other thing first, and I just wanna try to get this to truly be as, as personal as I can get out of you guys in front of thousands and thousands of people. As these last couple of years have happened, and as you've both risen in profile, and you're out there saying what you think all the time and defending your beliefs and, and being friends with people like Sam, who you disagree with on different things and all that, uh, what, what's sort of been the most personal thing that you've kind of struggled with along the way? I want to go deep before we open it up to the audience. Well, for me, it's two things. One is, for it's not so bad now, it's still pretty bad. Like, I've lived in constant existential terror of saying something that will be fatal. Because I've been in a this situation for 15 yep. months where <laughs> yeah, I if I said one, one, well, and there's been a, a few things that I've done or said that have people have argued skirted the edges, and perhaps they did, because if you say 10,000 things, <laughs> like something's going to skirt the edge. Yep. But I've, been, I've had to watch myself in an intensely hypervigilant manner to ensure that I don't provide those who would like to 
provide those who regard me as their enemy with the tools to dispense with me. Yeah. And, you know, I have my family resting on me as well, as well as whatever else I happen to be doing. So that's been extraordinarily intense. And the other thing is, is persistent feeling of surreal, surreality. That, see, one of the, th one of the markers of post-traumatic stress disorder is that you can't believe that what's happening to you is real. It's like I felt that, for, literally, I felt that way every single day since September of 2016. And so I just cannot get accustomed to, well, even just to the scandals that I've been involved in. It's just one scandal after another, yep. you know, and I, I, I don't know, I don't have a frame of reference within which to put this. Yeah, I think so, that, I, I'll just briefly say for myself, I think, I mean, both of those, right, we're all afraid of the one thing, that you're yeah. gonna accidentally just misspeak or say or something. Or they just take you right out of context. Take you out, a yeah. wave of and media designed to, so exactly. And so, you say something stupid defending yourself, you know, which you could certainly do. Or right. if you've been, I mean, I've been writing columns since I was 17. So right, and they like, come out, right. <laughs> yeah. No, I know there's yeah. one line with you that you once, one tweet that you sent that you regret right. now, and it's like. Not only do I regret the tweet, in the actual tweet thread, I explain exactly what I meant in the tweet, but nobody ever reads the next tweet that literally right. explains what I meant in that tweet. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't even right. have to it's, mention which tweet to just add more fuel to the fire, yeah, but, exactly. but, mm -hmm. but very quickly, because I do want to get to the, to the audience questions. I think for me, the second one is the one that I struggle with, the, the surreal one that sometimes I'll look and see what people are saying about Dave Rubin, this, that, and then, I, and then I, for a moment, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm Dave Rubin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think any of those, or even if I do think, even if it's yeah. something they're nice well, saying about me, I'm like, wait a minute, that, that's me. And, and also just the other part of, you know, we, we sort of live close to each other, yeah. you know, proximity. And I'll go out and, you know, the woman at Petco will say something nice to me. And then for some reason, they always say they like Ben Moore. But, mm -hmm. they, <laughs> but like, I go out and then I'm like, wow, like the things that I'm doing have meaning to people. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot of built in pressure, or at least for me, there's a lot it's of ethical like, responsibility. Yeah. You know, and well, I feel that too, because now when, whenever I go somewhere, people come up and they, they almost always say the same thing. They say, you know, I was in a pretty dark place and I've been listening to your lectures and they've really helped. Thanks a lot. And I think, man, if you could have your wish and you could invent <laughs> what strangers yeah. would say to you on the street. What a cool could, thing. No kidding. But it's also kind of a terrifying thing because, you know, people have pinned, well, let's say they've pinned their hopes on what, I've, what I'm saying. That's the right way to say it. But in some sense, that also means they've pinned their hopes on me. And like, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination perfect like far from it and so i do live in constant terror of sinking my ship in a, in a you know in a particularly awful manner. I still yeah. think that's the most likely outcome. Oh no, I will, this. Did you ever get this where you just wake up in terror in the middle of the night <laughs> that somebody is going to take something that you said out of context and you think, did i really say it exactly the way i meant to say it? Yeah, it's just, right. That's i mean that that yeah, that's that's a definite thing. And then you and the, the upside is that people listen to what we're saying and take it seriously, and the downside is that people that listen, listen to what we're taking and, and take yeah. it seriously. Yeah, no yeah. Kidding. <laughs> so for you then, would it be something, I mean, without getting too in the weeds, like something related to like security or something? I mean, you when you travel now, you have to have someone with you. I mean, I mean that's uh, freaking that, ridiculous. That, that I, th I file under surreal, because I actually have never thought of myself as in serious physical danger. Even mm. when people say, you're in yeah. serious physical danger, I think to myself like, this is America. Am I really in physical? Like, whenever I do these lectures and I've got a security team of 10 people around me, what I tell myself, and maybe it's me whistling past the graveyard, is I'm the safest guy in the room. I'm the one with the security <laughs> team. <laughs> but, um, but it's, yeah, I mean, that's weird. Uh, the, the confluence of politics now is so odd. I mean, last night during the State of the Union, they introduced Trump as the president of the United States, and I just find myself laughing out loud because <laughs> what in the world is going on? Yeah. Like, I forget that I like a lot of the stuff he's doing. Like, what in the world? And, and there's a, a I was reading a book about Brahms the other day, and in this book about Brahms, it talks about how he's hobnobbing with uh, with various other composers. How he's friends with Dvorak, and he has fights with Wagner, and he's and he's and he's walking in these circles. And I thought, wow, that that must have been a cool thing to walk in these circles. And then I look around, and I realize that the people that I work with in a hundred years, this may be the people that they're writing about, right? It's like, mm -hmm. the, and that was the day that, that Shapiro got together with Rubin and Jordan <laughs> Peterson and talked about deep issues of philosophy, and you realize. Well, how did we end up in this position? Like, are, uh, this is one of the issues of existential terror I have is, are we the best that we have to offer? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I look yeah. at all the people in the White House, for example, I know like half the people in the White House and I think, is this the pinnacle? Like, are, are, like, and that's not a rip on the people in the White House, that's a rip on humanity. Yeah. Like, is this the best that we can do? But you am know what, I, there's am a beautiful I even thing. close to like, why should I be in this position of prominence? Like, there have gotta be people smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, a lot of them. There's a beautiful thing out so there. Which is, yeah, I would hope, my God. Right, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's, I asked somebody this, uh, this thought experiment the other day, which would, which would you prefer to be? The smartest man in a dumb civilization or the dumbest man in a smart civilization? Mm -hmm. 
And I think I can honestly say I prefer to be the dumbest man in a smart Me civilization. Too. And some, there's something disquieting about being seen anyway as one of the smart people in a dumb civilization. Well, you know what? There are literally thousands of people watching this live, obviously, and that'll watch this over the next couple of months. And hopefully there will be some people that will come up with some better ideas than Ben Shapiro and Jordan I Peterson so. and yep. Dave Rubin. <laughs> yep. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll it, go find something else to do. All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a quick little break. Uh, I know already they're giving me the signal. We have like roughly 400 billion questions. We will do our best <laughs> to be brief. That's that's yeah. easy for you guys, yep. right? No, brief. Yeah. These guys. That's what we're known for. Yeah. That's another thing I'm known for. Or his <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So give us just like a minute or two. Uh, hang tight right there. And uh, questions in a moment. All right, guys, we're gonna to try to plow through as many questions as possible. As I said, Jordan is at the Orpheum Theater here in downtown Los Angeles tonight. It's sold out already, right? It is sold there, out. There's gonna be riots outside, uh, but if you have a ticket, you will see Jordan later. Uh, here we go, all right, super chat uh, for Jordan. We're gonna to try to do these as quickly as possible. I've recently taken your Understand Myself personality test and scored very low in all aspects of agreeableness. Mm -hmm. I have the cognitive ability to emulate these aspects and do so for the benefit of my kids and community. Yep. Is emulation enough, or do I have to actually take the steps in showing, in honestly showing agreeableness? Can you fake um, it, basically? Em, well, if, if, if emulation is motivated by, uh, let's call it a noble aim, the understanding that reciprocity is necessary, there is evidence showing that disagreeable people do quite a bit better if they go out of their way to do things for other people. Do they make that a practice? And the thing is, is if, if you're an introvert, you have to become a conscious extrovert, right? If you're, if you're, um, so, and if you're disagreeable, you have to become consciously agreeable. You can do it, and emulation is the first step to incorporating it, I would say. So, if you're doing it to manipulate people, well, that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Man, I mean, there's, there's a ton of people here that donated on Super Chat just to say hi and thank you. So, hello to everybody. Um, quick one for Ben, I think we've already hit this, but any chance of a future discussion with Milo? No. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I'd rather talk with people who have something to say. Uh, okay, here's an interesting one, and, and Jordan during the break mentioned that we should be doing a, a show on the future at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, like me, that abortion and artificial intelligence will eliminate humanity as we know it? I'm watching this new Philip K. Dick thing on, on no. uh, Hulu now, so I'm very oh, you can I'm make it through the electric dreams, sir. Well, we yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, I it's, tried it. I, I don't know. I can't get into it. Come on, you can do it. You're a sci-fi guy. Okay. You, you can get there. Well, we could talk about AI. I mean, yeah. AI is going to transform what human beings are dramatically. We're going to have to decide in what manner we want to be transformed. And we should bloody well hope 
and pray that the people who are leading the technological revolution are careful and ethical people. But don't, don't, hasn't that ship sailed? I mean, I feel like we know already that that's not how it's gonna be. We know there's so many problems related to the diversity memo and the algorithms and all that already from the tech companies. Sure, that's but there's my lots fear. of people working on these. Oh, you should, be, you should be terrified of this transhumanism. It's like, what do we want to turn into? We need a vision of the future, which is why we need to talk about the future. Yeah. What, I think one of the things we need to do collectively is to develop it's like, okay, I believe that the human race can do anything it wants in the next 30 years. You know, Gates was talking, Bill Gates was talking the other day about eradicating malaria. He's, he's really set on eradicating the five major transmissible diseases. That could happen. Yeah. It's like we could eliminate most of our problems. It's like, well, we should concentrate on the future that we would like to have and try to bring it into being. And then maybe we can get artificial intelligence to serve that instead of serving whatever inchoate and pathological set of principles that it's serving now, which we will suffer for. Yeah, well, let's cross our fingers. Uh, what is the likelihood that the SJW postmodern left collapse uh, will happen soon, basically? Um, I think that it's more likely than people think it is. I'll put it that way. I think that That's right nice. now the, the SJWs think that they're on top and they think that they are ascendant. And I think the, the growing popularity of people who are not that Especially among young people. I mean, my entire audience is young people. Like, yeah. Legitimately, my entire audience is people who are under the age of 40, and probably half my audience is under the age of 25. And I would I'd probably imagine it's the same for you, Jordan. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that the, there's a, the whole group of young people who are just looking at this stuff and innately saying, I'm bored with it. There's mm -hmm. nothing here. And so I, I think there's a good shot that, that the identity politics is actually an older person's game. Yeah. Uh, all right. You know, we're, we're only going to do two more. We'll, we'll categorize all of these and maybe and next time you guys are on, we'll, we'll, mm -hmm. hit, we'll hit some of these. Um, but we'll do two more because I, I think they're good. They sort of hit right where we're going here. Uh, I, you both can answer this, but it's directed to you, Jordan. Uh, any follow up on your call earlier this month for students to stand up and leave the classroom whenever the teacher mentions equity, diversity, and justice? And I know this is something you've talked about a bit about how you deal with yeah, college yeah. professors. Yeah, this approaches. was for junior high and high school kids yeah. to talk to their parents about. Well, I was trying to provide people with easy markers to note that their children are being indoctrinated and not educated. And I said, well, if they talk about equity, diversity, inclusivity, white privilege, or gender, it's time to leave the class. And, I, and now, that had, didn't cause nearly as much trouble, that video, as I thought it might. Uh, yeah, that, you know? I mean, that's a pretty dangerous idea to be telling that to a 13, 14 year yes, old kid. Yes, yes, but it's also dangerous not to tell them that. And I mean, it's particularly germane in Ontario, where the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario has explicitly developed a social justice curriculum with that name, whose explicit purpose is to transform kids from kindergarten to grade eight into social justice activists. They've even bent the selection of literature to promote that. So they're perverting art for ideology. And that's the official policy of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. If they're gonna do that, play that game, then for me to say, look, here's five phrases that, that are pretty decently diagnostic. You can be pretty certain that if these topics come up in your class, that you're now into indoctrination territory. Yeah, I think people should walk. What's the risk, though, of saying that to a kid that may come home and the parents may not even understand these issues enough to, to defend it's them? It's risk, risk everywhere, man. It's, it's, it's the risk of going along with it. There's the risk of standing up against it. And I believe, and, and that's why I've been doing what I've been doing, is that I believe that the risk of stating that this is dangerous and should stop is way less than the risk of going along with it. I'm with so. you. All right, so this is, going to be, this is going to be the last one for now. We will pick this up at another point. And we also discussed during the break that maybe we can do some kind of live thing together fun, with, yeah. with this whole crew of, of people that we're talking about. We'll see who we can get to do that probably in LA, but we'll see. Uh, this one, I'm sure I've asked you some form of this uh, in our other interviews before, but I think it's it's the one that sort of hands this back to the to the audience. Uh, for both of you, for some time now, I've wanted to start doing something to protect liberty and Western values, et cetera, but I have no idea where to start. What's the most useful thing I can do to start as an average person? I mean, I think that it, my, my answer to this is sort of the same answer as to what you should just do in life generally. Find something that you're good at, find something you like to do, and find something that's useful. And where those three things con conflate, well, where those three things overlap, that's where you're going to be the happiest, and that's where you're going to feel you're making a difference. Because if you only have two of those three things, then you're butting your head against a brick wall. If you like to do something and you think that it's going to influence other people, but you suck at it, <laughs> it's not going to work for you. Yeah. So try to openly identify your own skill set. Find what it is that you're good at, and then figure, how do I use this skill set, something I'm good at and enjoy doing, how do I use that 
for a purpose that is that is useful. And it sounds like this, you already have your purpose. It's just a question of what can you do that, that actually helps effectuate that purpose. So I, without knowing your skill set, I don't know. But if I knew your skill set, then I could help define what you could do with that to get from point A to point B. Yeah, so I suspect you probably well, agree yeah. with well, that. But I what mean, about would, the courage you know, part? Well, I would just yeah. add a little bit to that. It's like there are some things that you'll see that will bother you. Some of those are your problems. That's why they bother you. Like, there's lots of things in the world that are happening that don't bother you. It's like, they're not your problems. Yeah. The things that bother you, for some reason, are your problems. Find something that bothers you, that you could fix, that you could start fixing, and start fixing it. That's, that's it, and, and you know, you should do it yeah. competently. Mm -hmm. Do it in a domain where you're competent. Do that it in a domain where you're interested. But there are things that you'll see around you that you think could be set right, that you could set right. It's like, Go for it. You'll get good at it. And then you'll set bigger and bigger things right. That's, and that's, that's where to start. Start small. You yeah. won't end small. I mean, I can tell you in the most intimate way, as you guys are now in my house, in my studio that we built, that's funded by the people that are watching mm. this, I just had an idea. And I started talking about it. I started a YouTube channel that literally everyone watching this can do. Mm -hmm. you start, I mean, look at the three of us. Mm -hmm. We all started putting stuff out there going, is this going to work? None mm. of us were greenlit. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been greenlit or had any respect from the industry altogether. Listen, guys, it was a pleasure. We're gonna let you, you, what do you do before a show? You can take a nap, maybe? Or? I'm definitely going to take a nap. Yeah, you, you don't take naps. Does Ben Shapiro uh, take I naps? I take naps, yeah. You take naps? Yeah, I have two kids. They're both oh. under, I mean, one just turned four. Yes, I take naps. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> All right, yeah, fair enough. Right. It's, it's been a pleasure, guys. Let, we'll figure out some ways to expand this to the wider group yep. and do some live events and everything else. Sounds great. And we'll, we'll keep this conversation going. Uh, thank you guys for all the comments. I promise you we're going we're gonna to list everything out. So whether you submit it on Super Chat or Patreon, we'll try to get back to all this stuff. And when I do my live streams, I'll try to address some of this directly. So thanks for watching. And thank you for YouTube for actually allowing the stream to be up. What are the chances we're monetized by tomorrow? I, God, I'd hate to bet. Luckily, I haven't been demonetized because I don't have any ads. So uh, how fortunate uh, well, for me. Self-select out. All right. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Nice guy.